Alpha Protocol is a 2010 spy thriller slash breaking down doors slash social simulator slash bizarrely nostalgic time capsule of late noughties to early 2010s geopolitics like oh my god we had no idea how worse things were about to get in just a few short years RPG developed by Obsidian Entertainment. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't even know where to start with this game. It's so flawed yet so brilliant at the same time. A game so mind-bogglingly broken and unfinished that it has no business joining the ranks of the all-time greats of the RPG genre. Or so you would think. Because you see, Alpha Protocol is not just any RPG. For every one thing it fails gloriously to achieve, it succeeds in five others. Granted I might have inverted the ratio there for dramatic effect, but you get what I mean. This game is freaking hard to assess properly. One might say that reviewing this game is a sort of YouTube rite of passage, kinda like getting your first sponsorship email from Raid Shadow Legends. So here I am today talking about one of the most beautiful messes this medium has ever seen. Before I I launch into my feature link for ramblings, let's set some house rules for this video. First I'll try my best not to focus too much on bugs unless strictly necessary. Alpha Protocol has been out for 12 years at this point, the public is well aware of the bugs and frankly I don't wanna cheapen this video by essentially doing the video review equivalent of beating a dead horse. Not even for the sake of squeezing some extra engagement out of this video. Maybe that's why I will never make it on YouTube. Anyways, <clears throat> secondly I will also not talk about the legendarily messy development of Alpha Protocol because it's been well documented in other places. I highly recommend watching my buddies I finished the video games his own retrospective as he did a great job in this respect. It's like almost 2 hours long, I don't know how he does it, dude's a freaking video game machine, uh, beast. He's awesome, go watch it. I also have a Twitter where I occasionally drop links to 90s hip hop bangers and a Patreon where you can support the channel with real life money. While we're here, I want to express my eternal gratitude to my friend Girakian, whose assistance and deep knowledge of this game were a tremendous help in the making of this video. Let's get this ball rolling. Ah, oh, great. Picture of Darcy. He wrote, Mike and Sean, fuck yeah! With three exclamation points. Alpha Protocol debuts with some grainy footage showing a commercial airliner falling victim to what is clearly a terrorist attack of sorts. We are then taken to a nondescript military facility where Michael Fortin, the playable character, wakes up from his slumber. Michael quickly shakes off the effects of whatever drugs he was exposed to, picks up the conveniently located PDA from the same room, has a chat with his handler and finds out he's been kidnapped and has to escape. He then fights a few goons and oh yeah no, it was an any universe training exercise doubling as a tutorial section. Very clever, totally didn't see that coming from a mile away Alpha Protocol. Anyways, here's the gist. You play as Agent Michael Fortin, a recent inductee into Alpha Protocol, a highly classified super duper secret black ops agency that operates outside the confines of the law and government oversight. This agency is so classified that its existence is known only to a small number of high ranking officials, and even they are kept at a significant remove. This separation between the organization and the US government is intended to protect the latter from any political heat resulting from information regarding their rogue operations leaking to the public. That's because Alpha Protocol has a double meaning. It's both the name of the organization itself and the term used by the intelligence community to describe rogue agents. To be more specific, going Alpha Protocol is a euphemism for agents who are acting alone and or are traitors. So for example, if Alpha Protocol's operation Dumbfuckitis goes incredibly wrong and the public catches wind of it, the US government can deny any knowledge and involvement and say it was a scheme cooked up by a lone actor. Another interesting Alpha Protocol related euphemism is something called the Yellow Brick Road. It's not a cross departmental office in the rock band, but an actual like, I don't know how to call it, policy? It works something like this. While Alpha Protocol will provide agents with the funds and tech needed for their assignments, agents are encouraged to build their own networks of funds and resources. These can include offshore bank accounts, safe houses, black market arms dealers, malls and informants in important places, and so on. The reason is pretty simple to guess, so that any source of funds cannot be traced to Alpha Protocol and by extension to the US government. This operational philosophy is so ingrained into the organization's culture that, according to rumors, even Yancy Westbrook Bridge, Alpha Protocol's chief of operations, follows it. That's right, the agency's own leader has to walk the same path as your regular lowly field agent. 
all in the name of secrecy and preserving the government's reputation. Weirdly enough, this brings me to a not insignificant, let's call it world building issue. Now this is cool and all, the secrecy, the cloak and dagger, the building their own networks of contacts and all that, but uh, look. Now I'm neither a spy nor an expert in this field, no pun intended, but I did read a couple of Wikipedia pages on espionage, so I'm basically like almost there. I'm fucking with you. Okay, so the day-to-day -day life of an intelligence officer is super stressful, even without all these veils of secrecy. It's a thankless job. Now imagine that on top of all the usual quirks that come with it, if something goes wrong or information reaches the other journalist, you're left to the wolves. It doesn't even have to be your own fault. You not only lose your job, but you're also declared persona non grata in the intelligence community and hunted by the same government that hired but didn't really hire you because remember, you're by all intents and purposes a traitor. Who the fuck would want to work for such a place? Why would anyone leave a quote unquote cozy intelligence post for this madness? Further, Alpha Protocol only hires the best of the best. Wouldn't that be a huge waste of talent? It's not like these young, highly trained, competent intelligence officers grow on trees. Not to mention the fact that later in life they could go on to hold important decision-making positions. Bureaucrats, politicians, ambassadors, and any number of offices that have the power to dictate the course of a country. I don't know, it just seems super impractical to me. Don't get me wrong, I like this from a conceptual level, but I just can't see any intelligence officer in the right mind agreeing to this insane arrangement. Maybe if it works something like, look, in the highly likely scenario where we'd have to publicly out you as a rogue agent, we will provide provide you with a fake identity and a generous government pension, or any other form of protection as a reward for serving your country. Something like that. However, if that were the case, the plot would have been entirely different, as the fundamentals of the story beats rely on this idea of a globe-frotting rogue agent struggling to untangle a conspiracy and prevent a third world war from erupting. Now, to be absolutely fair to the game, this is neither the first nor the last piece of media whose world building relies on this sort of suspension of disbelief. I am willing to turn a blind eye as long as it works in the context of its setting and contributes to an absorbing and entertaining story. And fortunately, in Alpha Protocol, it works like a charm. Rarely have I been so entranced by a piece of fiction. This is mainly due to the meticulous effort the writers put into building Alpha Protocol's world. So much stuff to talk about here, from the emails that reveal bits and pieces of the world's geopolitical climate as viewed through the lens of the characters who send them, to this backgammon set in the Moscow hub. It's not a... physically accurate. In fact, it may be the most fucked backgammon set I've seen in my life. But it is a very popular game in Eastern Europe, so bonus points for authenticity and attention to detail. Of course, every espionage story worth its salt tackles the subject of mass media in some shape or form. The game employs the usual news story covering the events of a prior mission mixed with non-related events occurring in the game world shtick, which is pretty cool. I don't have anything else to add here, honestly, apart from the fact that some of the news stories oscillate between tongue-in-cheek satirical and creepily prescient. Don't expect the same level of prescience as Deus Ex though. Oh, before I forget, one of the news stories covers a piece of new legislation called People Over Rich Corporations, or PORC Act. This bill would prohibit lobbyists from contributing to election campaigns and physically restrict people affiliated with corporations from approaching members of the legislative branch. Why did I bring this up? Because PORC, or PORC, means pig in Romanian, which I found very amusing. <laughs> Sorry, I have the soul, mind and humor of a 12-year-old child. There's also the faction and individual dossiers detailing the web of alliances and rivalries. More on them later, because believe it or not, they have an actual gameplay function. For now, all I can do is urge you to read them from their metaphorical cover to cover. I had so much fun unlocking additional excerpts and secret facts. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the gameplay. Big ass screen. Saying that Alpha Protocol's gameplay is problematic would be an understatement. It's all kinds of broken. But let's establish the fundamentals of the gameplay first. So at its core, AP is a third-person action role-playing game where players assume the control of Agent Michael Fortin. At the start of the game, players can choose Fortin's agent history. They are free in total with each background corresponding to a specific playstyle. Soldier focuses on heavy firearms tech specialist for gadget-centric gameplay, and field agent, which encourages players to use stealth. 
There are also freelancer, recruit and veteran options, which allow players to custom build their characters. For a first playthrough I recommend choosing field agent and stealth oriented abilities, for reasons I'll reveal a bit later. Speaking of abilities, Alpha Protocol has a quite extensive skill system that covers all kinds of activities from shooting, stealth, hacking, gadgets, to more traditional things like endurance and so on. Unlock enough ranks in a given area and you get an active ability associated with it. For example, investing a certain number of skill points and pistols unlocks Chain Shot, an ability that slows the passage of time and allows players to kill enemies in rapid succession. From a design perspective, Alpha Protocol's skill tree has a surprising amount of depth in terms of customizing Fortin the way you want. As for the moment to moment gameplay, AP has a pretty straightforward structure. Missions typically start in safe houses, where players can select missions, access the black market to buy weapons, gadgets and intel, and customize slash upgrade weapons. Here's the cool part. After the introductory mission in Saudi Arabia, the game opens up and lets players tackle the three major locations, Moscow, Rome and Taipei, in whatever order they want. I'm not quite sure if the order influences the story in any way, but given AP's ridiculous reactivity, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. I mentioned earlier that you can buy intel from the black market. This is another cool system that I wish other games would experiment with, as it's a great way to handle difficulty and add flavor to gameplay. Basically you log into AP's equivalent of the dark web and purchase small favors, which can range from a dossier on a certain target or faction, paying context to leave dead drops of weapons and gadgets, and even decreasing the number of high level enemies in the location you're supposed to infiltrate, amongst other things. By the way, I love the in-game explanation for the latter, Fortan essentially pays someone to ensure that certain guards will be off duty on that day, which is pretty cool. Some favors you unlock by making certain choices. For instance, because I agreed to collaborate with Shahid at the beginning of the game, later in the campaign he ordered his troops to stand down and not interfere with my mission. This is one of the coolest and most thematically appropriate mechanics AP has to offer, and it's probably the closest a game has ever gotten to simulating the art of spycraft in a way that's both fun from a game design perspective, but without feeling gimmicky. It really puts you in the mindset of a spy using all the tools from their toolbox to achieve their goals. This takes us to the self-contained missions, which is where Alpha Protocol's utter brokenness is at its most revelatory. I will kick things off with some positives to make the transition to the negatives less jarring, so here's the cliff notes on what I liked. Relatively open mission structure that lets you approach objectives in whichever order you want. There are some examples to the contrary that I will touch on later. A decent variety of options to overcome challenges. For example, you can disable cameras via hacking or by throwing the odd EMP grenade. A finicky but functional cover system. Mission design that supports both stealth and aggressive playstyles. When a mission requires Fortin to avoid engaging enemies or civilian casualties, you are not punished with a game over screen for not doing so. Rather, the game and story adapt to your decision in some way. Say you lose reputation with a character or a faction. Obsidian's decision to mix and match action-oriented <coughs> missions with dialogue-driven ones. Some assignments will have you grill people for intel, which I really like. It's a clever way to keep the game grounded and compensate for the outlandish, high-tech gadgetry present in this world. My favorite dialogue-driven assignment is the one where Fortin reaches out to a Russian underworld figure for information. No shootouts, no drama, no nail-biting tension, it's just you and this dude like talking in a bar. And finally, the mission summary that shows the number of completed objectives and player decisions. This is a godsend given the intricate web of choices and consequences this game contains. And that's about it as far as the positives are concerned. As I said, the self-contained missions are where the game's rushed out the door nature becomes truly apparent. It's Possibly the most jarring mix of half-baked systems and poorly implemented mechanics that I've ever seen. Let's start with the hacking minigames. There are three in total. A word search puzzle where you have to match two random sequences of characters. To complete this minigame you basically have to look for the code that doesn't move and drag the code on top of it. You move one sequence of characters with your mouse and the other with WASD. The codes on the screen refresh so you have to move fast and find the matching sequence before time runs out and it triggers the 
the alarm system. It takes some getting used to. My main complaint concerning this minigame are the wonky controls, as there seems to be a slight delay in the movement of the code controlled with the mouse, which makes things more difficult than they should be. I didn't particularly enjoy this minigame, it definitely could have used some fine tuning. Thankfully the game throws a bone to players in the sense that story essential minigames are made intentionally easier. Further you can make it easier by investing skill points into sabotage or by applying certain armor modifiers. You can also outright bypass computers with EMP grenades, but with a caveat. You can bring a certain number of EMP grenades with you into each mission, with no option to increase the number of slots. The second hacking puzzle is a circuit breaker type of game where you have to clip circuits in order on a timer. This one's pretty straightforward, although the poor UI and color choice makes tracing the circuits more difficult than it should be. So much so that at one point I just gave up and started physically tracing the circuits on the screen with my finger. Finally, lockpicking. This is by far my favorite of the bunch due to how tactile it feels. What I don't understand is how failing to bypass an analog lock triggers the electronic alarm system. I've since lost the footage but I recall picking the lock on a container in the front yard of some warehouse in Rome, in game not in real life you fucking animals, and triggering the alarm system upon failure. How? Don't tell me it was somehow connected to the security network, because I just don't buy it. Anyway, not a big deal. As poorly implemented as these hacking puzzles may be, at least the rewards make them worth engaging with. So that's hacking crossed off the list, but what about the rest? Doesn't look too bad, right? Oh boy. As I said earlier, players are free to approach encounters aggressively or stealthily. The rub is that both playstyles are broken for their own different unique reasons. For one, the gunplay is absolute dog shit. Aiming and handling are attribute driven, so technically the more skill points the player invests in a weapon class, the better Fortune becomes at using it. Kinda how Deus Ex did things. The problem is that regardless of how many points you dump into a gun, the gunplay still feels like shit for reasons I'm incapable of articulating. I think the footage speaks for itself. Assault rifles, shotguns and SMGs are downright unusable and I dreaded the moments when I was forced to use them. Thankfully, out of sheer luck and my well-documented bizarre affinity for video game handguns, I had accidentally committed to a pistol build, which coincidentally is known for being atrociously OP. For one, Chain Shot is incredibly powerful the more points you invest in it, to the point that it trivializes some boss fights. Yes, you heard me right, more on the boss fights later. Secondly, and I don't know how to put this, you can line up headshots from behind cover while blind firing, which is absolutely ridiculous. Just look at this, all it takes is waiting for the reticle to shrink and you can one-shot even the most powerful enemies. And I kinda sorta love it. Moving on, stealth has its own set of equally broken and hilarious quirks. First, take a look at this crouch animation that makes Fortin look as if he's on the verge of taking the wickedest shit in the history of covert operations. I gave Vampyr a pass for the Victorian diarrhea shuffle, so it would be hypocritical of me to condemn Alpha Protocol for its own take. To be perfectly fair to Obsidian, Alpha Protocol predates Vampyr by about 8 years, so maybe its legacy looms in areas of game design that no critic or game historian has dared to consider. I wish this IBS simulating animation was the only problem plaguing the stealth system, but it's not. As you would expect, the enemy AI has that lovely mix of brain dead and incredibly observant. Sometimes they lack any sort of peripheral vision, other times they'll notice the tip of my head poking out from behind cover. It's a mess. This would not have been a huge issue if the game allowed you to move bodies. However, this feature, a staple of the stealth genre, is nowhere to be found in Alpha protocol. Which leaves you with no option other than to pray to the gods that the body of the guard you knocked out disappears before his buddy sees it. The skill governing stealth is also insanely unbalanced. Case in point, Shadow Operative. It's an active ability learned from the stealth skill. When activated, you are invisible for the duration of the skill provided you don't run or fire a weapon. That's basic Shadow Operative. At master level, you can run and remain unseen. Engaging in melee combat or firing weapons negates the effect. Stealth takedowns don't. You see where I'm going with this? The ability to perform takedowns while invisible, coupled with the insanely generous skill duration turn you into a monstrously powerful stealth machine. 20 seconds are more than enough to clear a couple of rooms worth of enemies even without running. You can run around invisible and punch everyone in the throat and still have enough time to pick a lock before the skill expires. I can't believe this made it past testing, it speaks volumes about how rushed this game was. And you know what? I fucking love 
of this, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, look me in the eye and tell me you've never wanted to play as an invisible stealth goblin. Which is also the name of my new OC's cover band. I mentioned Alpha Protocol having boss fights, and this is where the game makes it so bad it's good territory and becomes just bad in the traditional sense. Think Deus Ex Human Revolution boss fights, but worse. You play the game your way only to be caught unprepared because your build is incompatible with the mechanics of the boss fight. Some boss fights are laughably easy and exploitable, like here's me cheesing the hell out of Sis. Standing behind a specific piece of cover seems to fuck with her script. She'll take cover behind a table, leaving her entire body exposed. Eh. Other bosses are not so exploitable. I'm talking of course about the infamous Bryko encounter. The setup is pretty cool. You fight a psychopathic cocaine-fueled Russian mob boss in a replica of an 80s nightclub while autographs turn up the radio plays in the background diegetically on Braco's beloved stereo system. Anyways, this fight fucking sucked for me because I was playing a stealth spare as many people as possible build. After about 5 failed attempts he bugged out and proceeded to run in the wall. I heaved a sigh of relief and started blasting him with my assault rifle, but to no avail. Dude was freaking invincible. You see, Breko has two phases that he switches between as you're dealing damage to him. A ranged phase and a melee, cocaine-fueled phase where he gets up close and personal to you. You're not supposed to kill him before he enters the first cocaine-fueled phase, that's just the way the fight is scripted. So I had to restart the fight. I tried everything, throwing incendiary grenades, running from cover to cover and trying the pistol blind firing trick. I even invested some skill points in assault rifles and martial arts mid-fight hoping that will give me just enough of an edge over Breko to beat him. Nothing worked. I spent an entire evening on this boss fight and just when I was ready to give up and hit the sack because I had to go to fucking work the next morning, he bugged out again. This time after he had gone through the cocaine fueled phase. I gladly filled him full of lead, blew his fucking brains out in the post fight cutscene, went to bed and slept like a baby. The next day, a humid and miserable Tuesday morning, I stepped on dog shit on my way to work. So yeah, the boss fights, they're way out of place and go against everything this game stands for. There's one more small thing I want to address before moving on to the next section. As much emphasis as this game places on non-linear player progression, some self-contained levels are dragged down by some dubious mission design. Here's an example. A triad boss had me eliminate three treacherous lieutenants who broke away from the organization. Cool. Meanwhile, I found out that there's more to the story, so I got a secondary objective to uncover the truth. Cool, cool, cool. So, I figured in my naivete, I might as well go for the secondary objective and then decide what to do with the lieutenants, right? Well, no. Because the gate leading to the secondary objective magically unlocks only after you eliminate the first target. Doesn't matter if you kill or knock him out, the game treats him as dead. Same thing applies to the other targets. Weird. I assume Obsidian were running out of time and didn't manage to implement alternative options. Eh, it is what it is. Okay, rant over. Truth be told, apart from the break of boss fight, I haven't had any major issues with the gameplay, as broken as it is. Just minor annoyances that were quickly forgotten by the sheer amount of stupid mindless fun this game unintentionally provides. Now let's move on to the real reason we are here. Alpha Protocol's most ambitious feature and arguably the one that ensured its spot in the canon of cult games. With you in a sec, buddy. Not too uncomfortable, I hope. Now this, this is dry cleaning solution. Active ingredient is perchloroethylene. Get stains out like a champ. Like a champ when, believe you me. It's gonna be hard getting that stuff down his throat. Want me to get a funnel? A funnel? Yeah, that's a killer idea. Outside of the self-contained action-packed missions, you'd think you were playing a whole different game. You see, the James Bond side of the game, the gadgets, the martial arts, the conveniently located zip lines were just for show. Well, not exactly for show, they obviously put a lot of effort and passion into these things. In reality, Obsidian's real goal with Alpha Protocol was to make a game around the Byzantine web of secrecy governing the world of espionage. Writing a decent spy story wasn't enough for Obsidian. The subtler, more cerebral aspects of espionage had to be reflected in the gameplay. But how does one do that? Simple, you focus on the one task that spies are trained in even more rigorously than handling ridiculous gadgets. 
talking. Alpha Protocol is just as much about talking as it is about infiltrating embassies in the dead of night and punching terrorists in the throat. It's a game where one word said at the wrong time can trigger a chain of events so mind-boggling in its complexity that it would make dark writers hyperventilate. Because what you say and do in this game does have consequences later down the line, but not in the superficial surface level way many games do it. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, let's take it step by step. Let's talk about the dialogue system in general. During conversations, players get three base responses professional, suave and aggressive, and a fourth situational dialogue choice. Now, single word dialogue choices have historically gotten a bad rap because they're often not reflective of what the player character actually ends up saying. It's been a while, but I recall Mass Effect having this issue. The obvious solution to this would be to display the dialogue options in full, like Kotor did. The downside, along with the obvious one of forcing players to read through tons of text, is that this tends to bring conversations to a screeching halt. We can argue about which one is superior until the heat death of the universe, for what it's worth, I think both approaches can work depending on the game. But that's not what this video is about. Bar a few exceptional cases, Alpha Protocol does a great job with this one word dialogue system. It strikes a good balance between conveying the tension stemming from not knowing exactly how a conversation will play out, and the assurance that the dialogue choice you pick will roughly correspond with what the character will say. Again, it's not perfect, but you have to keep in mind that Obsidian had to also take into account the flow of the conversations and multiple branching conversational paths, all of which had to be written, animated and voice acted. This is partly why no developer had ever gone to these lengths until Obsidian, because it's a logistical fucking nightmare, and we've barely scratched the surface of this historic, yes, you heard me right, achievement of game design. There are other aspects both directly and indirectly related to AP's dialogue system that deserve praise. For one, Obsidian added a timer to conversations, which not only enhances the spy theme of the game, but also encourages players to make natural decisions. Secondly, conversations can branch off into multiple mutually exclusive paths. This, coupled with a checkpoint system, means that players can be locked out out of large chunks of content due to their decisions. A ballsy move from Obsidian for sure, but one that they apply to New Vegas with great success as well. It's worth mentioning that you're not exactly playing 6D dialogue chess, nor are you relying solely on your gut instinct. See, every character has a preferred stance. Some like to be flattered, while others would rather you get straight to the point. This is where dossiers come in. I mentioned earlier in the video that dossiers are more than just flavor text and that they actually serve a gameplay purpose. This is what I meant. Dossiers are chock full of intel that you can then put to good use during conversations. For example, by reading Westridge's dossier, I discovered that he prefers daredevil types. I let this information dictate my responses and I gained reputation points with him. Granted, this was the tutorial. The dossiers aren't always as clear-cut as to how players should approach certain characters, but the game gives you enough information to figure it out by yourself. For instance, it's quite obvious that an ex-Russian gangster turned oligarch won't take too kindly to clowning, or that an award-winning photojournalist dislikes dishonesty. However, some NPCs aren't as easy to read. The, uh, Tarantino-esque freelance black ops agent comes to mind. Then there's the fact that NPCs aren't assigned one predefined stance that they'll always respond positively or negatively to. At some point you have to throw your dossiers in the bin and rely on your instincts. This forces you to pay attention to context and to the flow of the conversation. You know, like in real life. Now dialogue choices affect more than just your reputation with NPCs. Nearly everything you say in this game has ripple effects throughout the narrative, both immediate and delayed. Here's a small example. The game had me assign responsibilities for an operation. Scarlett, the photojournalist, was supposed to keep a businessman busy in the hotel bar. When she asked me how she should proceed, I was like, well, like use the skills you've acquired throughout your career, distract him with clever quality conversation, I, I don't fucking know. It never even crossed my mind to ask her to flirt with him. Later, she sent me an email thanking me for not regarding her as just another pretty face. A cool small piece of reactivity that 
really made me smile year to year. Players can also make numerous important decisions that affect the state of the world. These effects can come in many forms, like causing certain characters to aid or undermine Fortin's mission. Early in the game I decided to ally with Albatross, a high-ranking member of G22, a covert terrorist organization. He is the mentor of Sis, one of the boss encounters I mentioned prior. One of the Taipei missions has you infiltrate what is later revealed to be a covert G22 base to plant a bug in their system. After the reveal, I started panicking at the thought that I may have burned the bridge. But here's what happened. Because I had spared Sis, decided to trust Albatross early in the story, saved his life to the detriment of the mission and agreed to delete the bug I had just planted on their servers, Albatross turned a blind eye to my indiscretions and reinforced his support for the final mission. And this is just one example, the sheer quantity of branching paths are enough to fill a video twice as big as this one. What's truly mind-boggling is the lengths Obsidian went with these story variations. Accounting for player decisions with a couple of in-game emails is one thing, doing so via fully animated and voice acted cutscenes is another. It's insanity. And to reiterate a previous point, ballsy as hell, because it inevitably leads to locking out players out of huge chunks of content. Like, you'd think Westridge and CA are story vital characters. Depending on your decisions, CA can be a boss fight or even a potential romance option. Westridge's status in the story is just as important, and they barely appeared in my playthrough. The narrative permutations I triggered with my choices reduced them to mere cameo roles. I would go on, but I risk spoiling the story. Hopefully I managed to convey the extent of Obsidian's achievement through this short section. But before we end the video, there's one last thing I want to address. As is the case with many games covered on this channel, Alpha Protocol has been banished to the realms of Abandonware in 2019 due to expired music licenses. For what piece of music specifically, we don't know and I don't think it even matters at this point. Consumers are functionally unable to obtain this game legally. Sega, the publisher and owner of the IP have shown no interest to greenlight a sequel, leaving Obsidian with no choice but to move on. Is where I would have ended things had my friend Gerakian not made a great point about Obsidian not actually needing Sega's approval to make a sequel. To crudely paraphrase him, Obsidian doesn't even need the IP, because it's literally explained in the lore that when Alpha Protocol is exposed, they close shop and resume operations under a different name. It would be so easy to make a spiritual sequel of sorts. The story even implies that Michael Fortin is an alias. So they could literally apply the same logic to all the characters and change their names while maintaining their personal histories. There's a not insignificant chance that they have already thought about this and just decided that it's not worth the effort, even though Obsidian has expressed interest in developing a sequel. Anyways, as for my input on the situation, I honestly don't know what an Alpha Protocol type game would even look like in 2022. AP is in many ways a product of its time whose geopolitical commentary has been made obsolete not due to shoddy writing, but rather the insane rate at which the world has changed in the past 12 years. Just take a moment and really think about what we've been dealing with since this game came out in 2010. A historic pandemic, the resurgence of far-right extremism, unscrupulous political actors manipulating the course of entire countries through social media, the gap between the rich and the poor reaching an all-time high, and tackling all those issues in a manner that would resonate with a society as polarized as the one we're living in now, I don't envy the writers who would have to do that. And that's my take on Alpha Protocol a flawed and incredibly ambitious experiment in reactive game design. And last but not least, a genuinely compelling and well-written spy game that tried its best to translate all the elements of the espionage genre in game form. A beautiful mess that truly deserved better. Thanks for watching. A huge thank you to my generous patrons for supporting this channel. I'll see you next time.